Hey, this is Manushka. Welcome to our Friends and Family YouTube channel. We're so excited that you have tuned in today. We believe here at VU that you never have to go at it alone. And so we've created content to help you along the journey. You're getting ready to hear one of our workshops from VUCOM 2023. We believe that it's gonna be a blessing to your life. Check it out. It's a big honor to be up here with these guys. Um, I've known Pastor S Dr. Scott for a long time and uh, have recently, in the last few years, gotten to know Pastor Stephen and two, like uh, Nick said, incredible leaders. And we're talking today about longevity. So we're going to start with the 60-year-old because me and Steve, we, we're still in process. <laughs> Sir, uh, my first question there's so many times that you feel like quitting as a leader, and I'm sure that you felt that. How did you get yourself to not quit? And tell me, what do you do when you have those feelings, those emotions, where you feel like throwing in the towel? Great question. First of all, before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, probably the two most significant people in my life that have pulled me toward longevity in my life is sitting right here. Uh, uh, Dr. Rich and Dr. Robin Wilkerson. I know that there is a real, there truly is an ethos. There's this beautiful conviviality about this conference. Okay, hold on, stop. You just yeah. lost us on that word. Say that, <laughs> say that word again because we in Miami, we're a long way from, from Minnesota. Anyways, no. what was that word? Conviviality, convivial. Woo! It's a great word. You got to look it up. Sounds great. Explain it, it to us, please. It has to do with an ethos, the ethos of a feast. And it really describes how do we live together. Uh, I don't mean live together like in cohabitation, but how do we as a society uh, operate together? So convivial or conviviality is a wow. great word. Yeah. Uh, you you got to go after it and study it, it's a, it and get it into your vocabulary. But there is this ethos of a banquet, of a feast, of this friendliness, this, this enthusiasm that we carry in our heart for the people that are near us. Uh, at this conference, and it, it, it is unique. It's, it's marked uh, this thing that I, I just don't want to miss being here. But uh, the Wilkerson's right here, uh, Rich Jr.'s mom and dad, along with the Durans, but the Wilkerson's are here. They've been the chancellors of the university that I've been the president of the last six years, and uh, they have just helped me succeed. And uh, I just honor you guys. I love you with all my yes. heart. I, I, yes. I wouldn't give them, honestly, I wouldn't give them a kidney. I'd probably give them a heart. Wow. Uh, and I mean that. I, there's nothing I wouldn't do for this because there's nothing wow. they have not done for me. Jeez. I love the Wilkerson so Jeez. much. Okay, so let's just talk about this thing, longevity. What's the thing that pulls us through? First of all, um, uh, longevity is simple to understand. Uh, don't self-destruct. The Bible's clear. The devil can't take me out. I can take you to all kinds of promises. The Bible's clear. You can't take me out. The only one who can take me out is me. So the key to longevity is simple. Don't self-destruct. The second way is to understand the difference in time. So longevity, we're thinking about chronos. We're thinking about uh, the Latin understanding for segmented time, calendars, clocks, years. It's how we measure uh, time and space is through chronos, chronology, chronicles of Narnia. Uh, a chronometer keeps a boat from losing its bearings. Segmented time, clock and calendar time is critical. You've got to be faithful with chronos. You've got to show up. Uh, you got to be present, got to be there. So chronos matters. But for Christians, the Greeks had another way that we don't often talk about, about time. It's not segmented time of clocks and calendars. It's the word kairos, which uh, the Greeks thought was um, chance or opportunity or fate. Um, it's, it's a way to look at moments. It, because if we're going to succeed... We have to be more in tune with Kairos than we, than we are Kronos. So Kronos is, okay, I'm faithful this year. I'm staying healthy. 
We have to operate in there. But kairos is different. Chronos is what time is it? But kairos is what is it time for? Wow. Not what time is it? And as long as I am in tune with what it's time for, so good. Wow. and I'm faithful to my what time is it, but it's not just about what time it is. It's about what's it time for. And so t sometimes it's Sabbath, it's rest, it's pullback, it's greater inclusion. I've got to be in touch with Kairos this whole journey or we will not make it. Wow. Can we clap? Anytime you hear that good of an answer, it requires a response, I think. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Pastor Stephen, when, when I talk about quitting points and um, the question of do you, do you ever feel like quitting, I loved um, Pastor Denny yesterday in, the, in his lunch with the with the heart surgeon every Monday. Um, what do you do to combat that? And what are, what are ways that you've kind of led yourself through quitting points? Well, first of all, I don't want to talk anymore because I can't use any of the words. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't know me, you're going to find out pretty quickly. I'm, I'm kind of ignorant. Uh, I used to make fun of those pastors who said, I want to quit every Monday. I, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm like, you're weak. Yeah. That's the problem. Like, you just, just, just keep your eyes on the prize. And for the first 10 years of being a senior pastor, I honestly never felt like quitting. Like, I loved what I was doing, loved the challenge. And it wasn't until that pandemic year. I was hitting year nine of ministry, and it was like the perfect storm. Nine years of church planner, exhausted, trying to get a building. You have racial tension, health crisis, all this. And for every senior pastor you know, that was a year you couldn't do anything right. If you said this, half your church is mad. If you say that, the other half the church is mad. And it was in that season that I realized I had a Messiah complex where I felt like I was propping up the church. And if I took care of myself, if I stepped away, if I rest, if I just breathe, that the church would come crumbling down because it needed me that much. And it really was in that season where God kind of just snatched everything that we knew as church and yet the church did not crumble and actually came out on the other side stronger than we went into it, that we realize he uses us, but he doesn't need us. It's his church. It's his bride. And when you catch that, so since then, I've learned to sabbatical, learn to rest, learn to step away, learn to have healthy paces. Uh, but my first time I wanted to quit, nearly took me out. <laughs> Yeah. And we've all been there. I think that's yeah. just the comforting thing is that when I when I hear people say, I felt like quitting, I'm always like, do tell. <laughs> what was that like for you? Because I know what it was like for me. And so, you know, we have these moments of frustration. We have these lids, these pain points could be a relationship, a frustration, money, whatever, whatever it is. I really like what you were hitting on with self-destruction. Talk to us about that, because I think that right there, leading yourself, is the key to staying in the game. Um, I, I think I said it yesterday, but it's a cocktail of bad decisions that get you into a mess, but it's a cocktail of great decisions that get you into health. Someone was saying yesterday, I'm not trying to build something bigger, I'm trying to build something stronger. Talk to me about that self-leadership of getting yourself healthy, because that's really our, our aim, our goal, is to be the healthiest version of ourselves. So, so I love nerd words. So here, here's a new word. Uh, it's a Latin word. It's called magis. It's a great word. M-A-G-I-S. Everybody needs to get magis into their vocabulary. Magis simply means better than before. Wow. Not better than you, wow. but better than I was before. Yeah. So whenever I compare myself to you, wow. I lose my way. I'm, I'm not closing the gap between you and me. I'm closing the gap on the inside of my life between who I am currently and the potential for who I can become. That's the gap I've got to close. So I'm not trying to close the gap of achievement between leaders because that's where we immediately swerve and then we begin to lose control of the car. Uh, um, I have to stay reflective in closing the gap inside my life. I also can't underestimate the, the severe uh, demonic turbulence that is directly assigned to the ministry and to people that are fully engaged and fully all in. 
How many were in the, my uh, session this morning? Hopefully very few of you. I, I, referenced, <laughs> I referenced this verse of Scripture in Acts chapter 13. The apostle Paul, Paul, and Barnabas go to their first. They go to the island of Cyprus. They walk 100 miles from Salamis to Paphos. And they meet a guy that is a Jewish magician, false prophet, named Bar-Jesus or Elimus. He's friends with Sergius Paulus, the pro the the guy with the clout on the island. Paul is trying to lead this political figure to the Lord. And it says that Elimus, this guy, is interfering in the presentation of the gospel, literally scrambling the gospel as it's being shared, this demonic uh, things going on to scramble how this guy's even hearing Paul's message. Paul realizes it's a waste of time to continue to evangelize with this demonic interference. So it says he turned from him and he says he looked the sorcerer in the eye. It's one of the great lines in the Bible. At some point, we got to look the sorcerer in the eye. He binds that spirit, shuts it down, and then he goes back to the evangelism. Well, that, that interference, that scrambling happens throughout our ministry. Um, I'll, uh, just a real fast illustration. I, I'm from the 1900s, so uh, I'm back. Uh, so I, I just kind of lump it in now because, yeah, back in the 1900s. I was born in 62, and so I just turned 60. And back in the early 70s, I wasn't allowed to go to movies. I was trying to sneak out of the house at 12 to go see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That was going to be uh, the big, you know, scary thing I had to cross. A movie came out called The Exorcist. Very famous movie. I saw the sanitized version of The Exorcist in the 1980s on TNT. But, you know, when her head began to spin, I just said, I'm out, I'm out. I can't take that. So the movie's about a little girl that's demon-possessed. And the movie's about these two priests who battle this demon for the entire movie. One, one priest is old, one priest is young. It's interesting. When, when the movie unfolds, the young priest dies first because he flat gets too scared. He drops dead of a heart attack because it's too troubling to engage the demonic for this young priest who wasn't seasoned. It just took him out. Is this too much? Then the older guy battled until the demon threw the old guy down the stairwell. He breaks his neck and dies. And once the priests were dead, the movie was over. Because, and the demon left. Because the, maybe the whole message of the exorcist is not about the girl or the generation that's being plagued. It's all about taking out the church. Because once the church was gone, the movie's over. So maybe what's going on in America in this playground of this generation of young people, it's heartbreaking. Their heads are spinning. It's all to take out the church in America. So I have to understand all the battlefield for my longevity is contextualized in this accelerated warfare to shut me down and take me out. So I've got to feel a valor and this thing rise up um, of nobility and poise and power, brotherhood, sisterhood, community, because I want to go the distance. That's right. And I don't want to drop dead because the times I'm in, I'm not fitted. Mm-hmm. And I simply am too afraid, so I'm just going to die of fear. Nor I want the devil to throw me down the stairwell. Mm-hmm. I don't want the, ch- the church. We're going to be victorious. Jesus is on the throne. I understand there's, limit, there's limitation to my illustration. Yeah. But he wants to take you out, you out, and me out, and everybody in this room. So, but he's not going to do it. We are going to stand firm. We're going to find the community. We're going to find the truth. God's going to help us. Not to self-destruct. I love that. So good. What comes to mind when I when I ask that question? You know, like leading yourself. I think it's the hardest thing in leadership is leading you. So I was watching SpongeBob, and um, (laughs) God help me. (laughs) No, I. You're, you're familiar with the kind of sports term or, or idea of watching game film, yeah. where you watch film of your opponent, 
to figure out what their tactics are so that you could come up with an offense or a defense or whatever. <coughs> and I feel like, to a certain extent, we have been naive of the enemy's tactics. Mm -hmm. And we keep getting caught off guard mm -hmm. and blindsided. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the, the falls, the compromises, that type of stuff, mm -hmm. it's often something that was instilled from childhood. It's often some type of unhealth, some type of family generational thing that's passed down over time. And because I didn't have the pressure of ministry in my life, it never exposed the cracks in my character. And then when the pressure comes, the cracks are, that have always been there are now being exposed. So for me, submission to spiritual authority, counseling, the whole deal, I'm like, man, how can I make sure that my soul is as healthy as I possibly can be? That I've got a sober and a healed view of my past. I've got a confident view of my future, view of myself, view of who Christ is in me, and then realize that as soon as your soul gets healthy, life will damage it again. <laughs> So it's not like once whole, always whole, but it's a lifelong journey of God. Can you continue to heal me? It, it, it's pride's not an issue this week, <laughs> but next week when something else comes up, I've, I've defeated insecurity today, but tomorrow something else comes up that I hate the word triggers, but that that brings up an insecure. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm depending on the size of the platform, you know. But for most times, I'm not intimidated preaching. I've been preaching since I was 16, love it, you know, that deal. I wrote my first book, and when I tell you insecurities that I thought I had conquered came flooding in because I was now exercising a gift that I had never operated in before. And it started the process of, God, you, you got to do work in my heart. God, you've got to help my view of you and my, help my view of me. Um, so I think it really is having sober judgment of the health of your heart yeah. and being intentional yeah. about being whole. Otherwise, it'll so take good. you out. So good. Let's clap for that. That's very good. Um, I've been stuck on this proverb, uh, a righteous man leaves an inheritance. And both of my father and my father-in-law, this is pretty cool, both my father and my father-in-law retired the same year, retired-ish. They stopped their ministry position, and they're still in the ministry. They're traveling, preaching, and trained up young guys, but they don't hold a position. Both of them were like denominational leaders. Uh, so I went to both of their services where they got, you know, the biggest applause and people crying, honoring them. No blemish, no asterisk, no whoops. You know, so I watched both my father-in-law and father finish well, so to speak. And both of them in the same year, I don't even think they knew they did this, told me how much they want to leave us as an inheritance to their kids. Dollar amount. At what age did you start thinking about legacy? Because we're young. What age did you start going like, oh, buddy, this is bigger than me. And my morals and my values and my breastplate of righteousness it impacts a lot more than just me now. What age was that for you? You know, disentangling that childhood chaos um, is uh, something we all have to process. Uh, people either come from a legacy platform or they come from a, a non-legacy platform, but both present unique problems. If I come from a godly family, the devil tells me I, I'll never live up to this. If I come from a place without a legacy, the devil tells me, I don't know what to become. Wow. <clears throat> so each, each possesses yeah. a unique dilemma. You talk to young guys that are getting married. I say, hey, let's talk about what kind of husband you want to be. And they say, well, I just, I, I don't want to be my dad. And they spend the next 10 minutes talking about <clears throat> the lousy modeling of their father. And I said, listen, not being your father is not a vision. <laughs> it'll create energy inside of you that will last about 10 years but you'll burn through that fuel by about age 30 because at some point the vision of what not to be 
has to be overtaken by the vision of what to become. And if you come like I did from a non-legacy platform, <clears throat> we moved 27 times by the time I was 16. We lived in a car. It's craziness. We had crimes committed in our house. <clears throat> had our water turned off all the time. My job was to s sneak over the fence, bring the garden hose from the neighbor through the rental property. And you haven't lived until you've brushed your teeth in baking soda and your neighbor's hose that tastes like chemicals. It's, it's joyful. Yeah. Um, now, I didn't live that way every day, yeah. but more, I, I, more than I could count. So I didn't come from, hey, I'm going to replicate this life. So uh, men and mentors stepped into my life, coaches when I was a kid. And then I started serving at, at a church. So where did I first start thinking about the long range? I got married at 19, Karen's 20. We're at Bethel Church of San Jose. I get to preach there tomorrow morning in San Jose. Wow. So the place where we started our ministry. Wow. <clears throat> and when I was 20, I had friends that were 20 because uh, we're attracted to our peers. But I also had some great friends that were 30 that had small kids. And they were happy Christians in that church. I had some friends that were 40 that had teenagers. I hung out with them. And I saw the Christian life wow. of what a 40-year-old that's successful would teach. I had friends that were 50. I was 20. I had friends that were 50. So I saw people that were happy in life with kids headed off to college, empty nesters. Wow. I had friends that were 60 in that church, real friends who had grandkids. Mm. And I had friends that were 70 in that church whose spouse had died. Wow. So I saw my life when I was 20 at 10 year intervals. Wow. And these were powerful mental images in my life of the future that I had no template from my own yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's why your church is so vital in your life. Yeah, it yeah. gives you the markers yeah. of what the life will, of what your life. So I saw how people gave their life away at 30, 40, 50, and 60. So I had these powerful positive. Because the older we get, we collect more negative than we do positive. We're like Caleb. Everybody in our generation has collapsed and died. You know there was nobody that was 70 years old in Israel in the promised land because you were 20 when you started if you were 20 you made it through i mean you lived if you were over 20 you died caleb and joshua were 40 which made them 85 when they closed escrow on the promised land which means the oldest israelite would have been 60 if they were 20 and made it through because everybody died so how do you develop when your entire generation deteriorates Caleb said, I'm stronger today <clears throat> than when I, as I was when I was 40 for war, for going out, for coming in, for anything life throws. <clears throat> Excuse me. He developed over time. He didn't deteriorate over time. <clears throat> that generational marker for me was critical. Is there a water hanging out here? <clears throat> that generational marker has been critical, thank you so much, boss, for keeping Karen and I mentally healthy and how to give our life away. But when the first grandchild was born, and I'm done here, that's when it shifted. When I got married, it's like you draw this circle, and you start drawing the circle, and the kids get born, and you're raising your kids, and they go to elementary school, they're playing high school football, I had two boys play D1 football, and we had a great life, and then my kids get married. I'm drawing the circle. And the minute they handed me the grandchild in my arms, my wife and I held that baby, the circle touched. There was a sensation of, of completion, not done, but so many things had to go right for my wife and I to both weep over that first grandchild. Um, so my goal in life is someone said, what's your goal? I said, I want to I become an elder. I want to be a godly elder. I want to be, so many things have to happen for eldership to emerge, not just age, but eldership in your life. <clears throat> but I would say my first grandchild came, but having those markers along the way that were dear friends gave me all the signposts that I said, life's going to be good and life's going to be good. And now at 70, this couple here, <clears throat> they're our marker. Life's going to be good because I look at Rich and Robin yeah. who are 10 years up on me. Yeah. You have to have those in your life yeah. if you're going to go the distance. So good. I love that. We're young, you know. 
We don't use Kairos and Kiros, and we ne- we're watching SpongeBob. Come on. Has any of this stuff, the, our circles are not, we're not, I'm not even at the, the six yet. Where, where, what, how do you feel about legacy? So, probably 15 different tracks my brain's going in. One, um, when I was 29 years old, I'd been pastoring my church for six years, and my pastor had a moral failure and wiped out a ministry. And it obviously rocked me. But I kind of stepped back and I'm like, what in the world happened? And obviously, I don't know the whole story. But from what I saw, part of it was my pastor was so insecure of whether his hopes and dreams would ever come to pass that he couldn't see anybody else, hear anybody else, receive from anybody else. It was almost like this paranoia incubator. And I remember at 29, I said, Stephen, who would you be, how would you act if you were certain every dream of your heart would come to pass? Do you think you'd be able to see other people? Do you think you'd be able to champion other people's visions and goals and all that? And I said, I don't know if my dreams are going to come to pass, but let me pretend (laughs) like they are going to come to pass. (laughs) And let me live from that place of, it was faked security until I found real security. But I remember from that moment, I started seeing other people's churches, caring about other people's problems, saying, hey, friendship matters, not just the size of your church, and all that other good stuff. And that's kind of where that legacy journey began. Um, Last year, I was preaching in another church. So I had one of my leaders preaching at um, Union, which is in Maryland. And then we launched a church in Charlotte. And we had our lead pastor in Charlotte was preaching there. And I was watching kind of both of the messages um, before I went out to preaching room. And I felt a level of pride of watching people that I had poured into, encouraged, championed there. And I realized the pride I felt in watching them win was actually a better feeling that I've ever felt when I preached a great message or stood on some platform or whatever it may be. So it's these little kind of just cues of, hey, Stephen, when you finish your race, you may not be as proud of your personal accolades as you think you will be. And you may be more proud of what you leave for other and that legacy. So I'm trying to... You said it, people our age don't really think about the finish. We're right in the middle of it and we're not, but I'm trying to force myself to see the finish and how do you want to finish? Who do you want to be when you finish? Even though it's not natural for us in this season. Last kind of thought, um, we live in a world where everything's the fastest growing, biggest list, all this other good stuff. And we made one of those lists and I, I, I just, come up with different phrases kind of just to keep me grounded. And when we made that list, I began to tell myself, they don't give out gold medals for fast starts. You think about the Olympics, no one ever got a trophy because they were the first out the blocks. Because they were the fastest on the first 20 yards or 40 yards or 60 yards. It's not till you break that tape at that 100 or 200 or 1500 or whatever. So whatever trophies you get before you finish, doesn't really matter because that's not the it's not the finish line so good let's clap for that i love that one too yeah build on that please Uh, pastor you're spot you're spot on um and i think the shift is this uh i know this sounds like a slogan uh but there there's a deeper prophetic application to this but leadership is not about production it's about reproduction and that's a huge shift of thinking. Yeah. Um, like I said, my son played college football at Cal, you know, was going to, going to go to the NFL, gets his knee blown out. We're playing Ohio State Buckeyes. And it broke my heart because that's actually me down there. I, I'm, I'm living my life through my son. He thinks he's playing. It's actually me. <laughs> uh, um, and, and it was over. Tried to come back. Knee wouldn't work. And he has to retire going into his senior. He's team captain at Cal, and he's done. Broke my heart, cried for three days, and he called me up and said, Dad, they want me to medically retire, and I'm going to become a coach. And I can't tell you the shift in my soul 
I, I went to practice, drove over there's 80 miles from where we lived in Sacramento, and I walked in the stadium and I see my son with a whistle. He's coaching Keenan Allen and Marvin Jones, you know, the, these guys. He was now a coach. And seeing him as a leader of men changed my world. As opposed to watching him play, my head was so huge. I, I was a D1 data. We played the Washington Huskies and Joe Montana's kid. Uh, Nick played for Washington. I'm a Montana freak. And before the game, I'm talking to Joe. And they said, what would you say to Joe after the game? I said, I just told him, hey, my kid played, yours didn't. <laughs> so, uh, 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 <laughs> true story. And uh, I was... Uh, I was messed up, oh my God. and I had to shift from production to reproduction, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. and the other key shift for me was this, is realizing that nobody's success in this life is robbing your potential. Right. So good. Nobody's success Say is robbing Say that your again. Potential. Nobody's success is robbing your potential. We have... Uh, a, a mindset of scarcity that we are afraid to resource. None of my kids were married on the same day. None of them had babies. Somebody's always arriving ahead of you, and you're always arriving ahead of someone else. Someday you're there to put the party on. Other days you're there to be celebrated. None of us arrive at the exact same moment for all of our dreams. So I, I tell leaders this. Imagine there's two little sailboats bobbing, or there's a sailboat bobbing up and down in the San Francisco Harbor. And imagine another little sailboat flies by that sailboat at full speed. Imagine the little boat bobbing up and down, yelling at the other boat, Hey, stop stealing my wind. <laughs> that boat would probably say, Get your sail up, dummy. There's plenty of wind in the harbor to sail more than one ship. And the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was also a mighty rushing wind. There's enough wind to fill every dream, every vision, every church, every life, every hope and destiny. Nobody's success is robbing your potential. There's plenty of wind in the harbor to sail every ship in this room. So don't have this reserve scarcity, rigid mindset about people's success. You got to help them. You got to celebrate. Give them a standing ovation. One of the dreams of my life is to make certain everybody gets a standing ovation at least once in their life. Yeah. To lead a standing ovation for somebody. We get them all the time because of the nature of our work. We tell people, stop it, actually. There's people that have never had a standing ovation in their entire life. Man, the greatest gift we give is how can I help create that? But I, I just have a commitment in my heart, man. Nobody's success is robbing my potential. So celebrate them. Help them. So good. I love that. You, you kind of mentioned it already, Pastor Stephen, uh, the commitment to relationship. You know, I heard someone say recently that every time God took them to the next level, it was always via a relationship. So to make it in longevity to me is not just like, I'm in the game. I'm still here. It's from glory to glory. It's, it's new adventures. It's, you know, following Jesus to me is the adventure of a lifetime. But talk to me about the importance of relationship, because one thing Rich Jr. said years ago, maybe when I first met him, he had this line that I've been using since. Your alignment determines your assignment and who you hit your wagon to. You know, I'm glad I'm with the Wilkerson's. I've been with the Wilkerson's since I met them. They're the Kennedys of the Christianity. I'm with royalty, fam. No scandal, but still royalty, okay? <laughs> um, but, um, sorry, it's the afternoon. Talk to me about, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with people. How has your commitment to relationship, because you talked about it, how has that shifted and given you the opportunity to be around for a long yeah. time? I mean, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. He introduces <laughs> himself as I'm a God of relationship. I'm a God of generation. You walk through all the greats of scripture, Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, 
Paul, Timothy, Titus, Onesimus. It was always this, hey, we're, we're doing life together. There's something in somebody else that unlocks what God has in you. I think there's two relationships that we've got to obsess over. There's got to be the friends that are not new. They knew you when, (laughs) and they can check you today. There's just something, and everybody's in this space where sometimes new people are overly impressed with you. And because they're overly impressed with you, they're just not going to keep it real in a way that you need it to be kept real. And then because there's people that kind of want something from you, you want to give them what they want. So sometimes you're not as transparent, you're you're not as vulnerable as you need to, just to sustain your soul. So you need those, hey, you're not new to it, you're true to it. We've we've been through some battles, We've, we've walked through some wars. But there are also new relationships that are gonna open you up to new yeah. revelation, to yeah. new impartation, to yeah. the new season yeah. that God has yeah. for you. And there's always somebody that God is looking to connect you to next that's, right. that's gonna yeah. open a door to your destiny yeah. that you did not see coming. So you've got, hey, I'm gonna keep the people that have known, that know me, that are pursuing God the way that I'm pursuing God. But I'm also gonna look to see God, what's that next relationship that you're looking to open up that's just gonna show me a part of your kingdom that I have not seen yet. So good. And and how do you do that locally? Another proverb I've been thinking about, I've been doing the proverb of the day, I've just been loving the proverb of the day. He basically says, you know, it's gonna be a tough day if you build all your friends around the, the world, but you don't have a neighbor with you in the day of crisis. Mm-hmm. How have you been able to do that from a local standpoint? Because you know you have a national uh, gift. God's opened up a lot of doors for you. How do you keep those commit, committed relationships even at a local level? Your, your, your requirement for friendship and covenant can't be shallow. So if your requirement for friendship and covenant is I only am friends with people that are as cool as I think I am or as popular as I think I am or they're only pastors or they're only this or they're only that, your requirement needs to be, man, you love God like I love God. You love me, that, that David and Jonathan deal. I'm committed to your future. You're committed to my future and our values align. And if that's the case, I don't really care how cool you may or may not be. I don't really care if you're a pastor, a business leader, or just some random person, but we, we can do life together if there's that divine connection. I love that. What do you think? I think he's right. Uh, um, uh, he, he, ab- absolutely accurate. Um, I would add this little edge to what he's saying, though. First of all, whatever you can't talk about owns you. If you can't, whatever you can't talk about owns you. And Dr. Robin Wilkerson today uh, nailed it when she said, we have to have people we work through life with. So I, I think there has to be friends in my life that have nothing to do with my career. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, you give me speaking engagements, I give you speaking engagements, our friendship is based on this transit. And of course I have friends that give me speaking, and of course I, we have that, this professional camaraderie that's legit, deep covenant friendships. But I have people in my life that have nothing to do with the ministry. They love Jesus, but they, it has nothing to do with this. I'm going to tell you what I saw today. So I've been a VU last two, uh, the whole time, last two nights. I'm sitting up in my section. I got my seat there. I'm sitting with Rich and Robin. Well, last night there's a guy there sitting between myself and uh, uh, Rich Wilkerson Sr. And he's kind of my age, uh, and he has a hat on. I'm thinking, man, is, it, is this an apostle from New Zealand? <laughs> who is this? So then it was a guessing game in my head. What famous, who is this? It's with Rich Sr., this apostle, this guy. It's an apostle. Rich, and he goes, hey, I want you to meet. This is uh, our gardener, the guy that cuts my lawn. I've been telling him all about Vu and my son. And so for the last two days, he's been sitting with the Godfather. 
And that's why this whole thing is believable. There you go. You're here. Stand up. I thought you were a famous apostle from New Zealand. And this is a wonderful man. Yes. My dude right there. But it blessed my heart. It blessed my heart. Because everybody, you know, we, we know how the celebrity thing works and power structures and all that stuff. But that's not what this is. We're about the kingdom of God. We're about souls. Rich has been a friend to everybody his whole life. And I saw it. So anyway, that, that's, that's key. If we're going to be successful in this relational community that's legit, remember the four greatest words in the Bible is let there be light. Everything that's in secrecy, things thrive in secrecy, but it's death that's thriving. So let there be light. I have to have people in my life that I can tell anything to at any given moment. I have to be able to tell them the unfinished business of my life, not the controlled narrative. And I have to be able to trust that they will do the right thing with the unfinished business of my life, which means I'm going to have to practice resurrection, not virgin birth. Now watch this. The virgin birth is cool. Birthing new things. The virgin birth is a big front page story. But the headline is the resurrection. I have to be able to bring things back from the dead. I can't spend my life starting new things. If I'm going to protect the progress of my life and leadership, I have to have a characteristic of my leadership that's marked by my ability to restore lost things, restore broken relationships. Uh, Paul, in his fervency, blows off Timothy, um, uh, who abandons them early, or not Timothy, uh, uh, John Mark, blows off John Mark on Cyprus, their first stop. He freaks out. He calls blindness over this guy because that's how Paul got saved. So that's how everybody's got to get saved. And he said, this is too intense. And he splits. Acts 15, the disagreement is so sharp. The first missionary organization's blown to smithereens. Uh, the first three, John, Mark, Paul, and Barnabas, is blown out of the water. Doesn't even make it to its second trip. So Paul takes Silas. Barnabas picks up the pieces with, his, with John, Mark. Now let's jump ahead to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Why is that important? The Apostle Paul started off his ministry. It, his first thing he wrote uh, was uh, the book of Galatians. And he said, I, Paul, the Apostle. Seven years later, he writes to the church at Corinth, I, Paul, least of the apostles. Nine years after that, he writes to the Ephesian church, I, Paul, least among saints. Ten years after that, he writes, second, or, or he writes to Timothy, I, Paul, chief among sinners. How over those 25 years did Paul go from, I, Paul, the apostle, I lead with cloud, I lead with title, to least of the apostles, least among saints, chief among sinners. It wasn't that he was exposing secret sin. He grew into the tenderness of his life and relationship to God's grace over time. So now he's chief among sinners, and he says in 2 Timothy 4, 11 through 13, hey, when you come, can you bring John Mark? We have to restore broken relationships. People that just keep moving on to new people, I'm going to cancel you. You, you don't you bring out the... I get all of that. Some things are not going to professionally work. You have to move on. I believe in boundaries. I understand all of that. However, we've lumped into that the destruction of every relationship that goes south. And we refuse to circle back and bring something back from the dead. Resurrection is a bigger deal than the virgin birth. Don't just start new stuff your whole life. Bring stuff back from the dead. So good. Um, I quit. I know this is about longevity, but I'm done. You want to go watch SpongeBob? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that one of, the, one of the sad things is that some people aren't in the story. You know, some, some things aren't restored. There aren't some people around. What, what is it as a cautionary tale? What bums you out about people that don't have a commitment to longevity? And what is it that when you see, you know, like 
I'm talking a lot about Proverbs here, but, you know, like he's like, I went by the young man's house devoid of understanding. I, I went by the lazy man's house and, oh, man, the we. When you observe the people that quit or people that have fallout, burnout, any of those things, what bums you out about people that aren't in the game anymore, so to speak? People that have, have uh, just, go, Demas left me for the world. What bums you out about that? And what kind of, when you look at that, go, I don't want, to feel that and, and live like that? First of all, that it bums me out. Mm. That I ha actually have an emotional response to the departure of faith or the unrealized potential of somebody. It bothers me, it agitates me. That's a good thing. That means my heart's still alive. Yeah. The minute I unplug from that or, I, or that's unnoticeable to me, something's deeply wrong inside my heart. Right. I have to always be aware of the unrealized things around me in people in an opportunity um but it, it just is we have to make that uh commitment to circle back and i think the older we get here's one of the gifts it's interesting when when the wilkerson's became chancellors we're just going to talk family here for a moment uh i led a university tremendous opportunity they become chancellors their sons were so blessed that mom and dad are chancellors of a university and it's interesting if a 30 year old became a college president we would go now at 30 you can lead 20,000 as a pastor but there's some assignments in this life that are reserved for time that like it would feel funny like washing your feet with your socks on like there's a 27 year old president of a university there's something about seasoning that is required in that assignment in life. So the older we get, that perspective, not to become some rigid curmudgeon. You know, my kids used to make fun of me, you know, how I did this or that. And I told my boys, I'm just going to live long enough to sit in a chair and watch you become irrelevant. <laughs> I'm going to sit there and just point out your receding hairlines. It's just, it's just wonderful. No, I don't want to be that guy in life. But you see in Solomon the, this journey. When Solomon was young, he wrote the Song of Solomon because life's all about pleasure when you're young. Then the bulk of his writing and editing was Proverbs because in the middle part of your life, because we go to the first, the sames, and the last, that's the three segments of our life, it's all about productivity, man. But then he wrote Ecclesiastes because he finally made it to perspective. And we all travel through pleasure, productivity, to perspective. And perspective is an unbelievable state of mind. It's an unbelievable emotional state to begin to see your environment accurately and to see the future. Just real fast, older people, the Bible speaks well of older. It speaks against old. So the old wineskins got to be dismissed. But yeah. the older train the younger. Older is highlighted. The idea is an ambassador. Here's what happens in churches is that you have old people because the ambassador is, represents another place to that place. Mm. Old people represent the past, and what they do is they walk into the past and they bring the past into the present mm -hmm. as old people. Mm -hmm. Older people who are seasoned that know the word, they travel from, to the future. Wow. And they bring the future to the present wow. because they're seasoned in the word. And they're alerting this generation of what is to yeah. come. Wow. Old people simply remind this generation of what was. Wow. Older people help guide them toward what is so to become. So I want to get older. I don't want to get old. That's the perspective of longevity. So good. Are y'all catching this communication genius? Yeah, that's God, crazy. I'm just, this man said, washing your feet with your socks on. I'm still stuck there. What, what, what bums you out? You know, you see people, uh, moral failure or mm -hmm. quitting on church, quitting on their faith, de deconstructing. D do you ever get sad? And, and what bums you out about people without 
a commitment to longevity. Yeah, I, I think I'm bummed on both sides. I'm bummed on their decisions and I'm bummed on the decisions of the church. I think um, restoration is one thing. Reconciliation is something else. Reconciliation is relational. Restoration is positional. If someone blows up their life, they may never get the position they once had. But that doesn't mean you're not a part of the body anymore. That doesn't mean we can't do life anymore. That doesn't mean that I don't love you anymore. And I think we've so combined identity and title that that we've bought into this cancel culture. That because you've disqualified yourself for that title, you now are no longer a part of this body, which is just not biblical. So I think that is on our side. We should always be looking, how can we raise the dead? How can we bring this back into the fellowship? Um, On the other side, it breaks my heart how we avoid temporary pain causing us long-term pain. So you, you were talking about anything that I'm not communicating or able to talk about is ultimately it owns me and it will take me out. The reality is if there's sin in my life, and I'm revealing it to spiritual authority. That's a painful conversation. <laughs> like, that's awkward. That's not fun, especially if it is now going to create, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's seasons of being away or awkward conversations with family or whatever. That's painful. Yeah. But because I don't understand how painful losing everything is, I'm avoiding the temporary pain of getting healed in this season. Or maybe it's not even, maybe it's just going to counseling. Maybe it's just dealing with the heart issues. It's, ah, it's inconvenience, pain. And what I do is I, I only embrace convenience now, which creates a car wreck later. And I'll look, whether it's a volunteer member that is just like, ah, if you would just get out that dude's house, I know it's painful, but like, that's not where you need to be, yeah. or whatever it may be, and, and you just see people take the convenient road yeah. and blow up their destiny, and yeah. it's just heartbreaking to see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, we take a moment to think about that because we, we don't want to cause our children pain, our grandchildren pain, our friends, and at the same time, there's a, there's a negativity is so powerful. I learn from people's mistakes, and yet the real motivation of my life is vision. Vision, it's not paranoia. It's not paranoia, it's vision. The vision, without prophetic vision, yeah. that's when I cast off restraint. But what disciplines me to move forward, forget the things that are behind me, press forward to the things in front of me, is the call of God and vision. And why do I want to stay in the story? Not just because... Man, that looks like that's painful. It's, man, I know that God's got something for me. God's got a plan for my life. So I think we should stand. And would you mind praying for everybody that we would have longevity of, of, of commitment to faith and ministry? Amen. Jesus, we pray what you prayed, that not a single person in this room would be lost. Uh, that every single life in this room would be fully realized, God. Lord, that you would, Lord, help us see about to see that about half our life is a result of good strategy and the other half we never saw coming. So Lord, help us to live in such a way that we can capture what we never saw coming because we have a Kairos way of approaching life, God. Lord, it's not what time is it, Lord? It's what is it time for? So Lord, bless every life. Thank you for these, for Chad, God, thank you for his life. And I just pray blessing upon my brother, this great, great young man. God, thank you for his life, for uh, Pastor Chandler, for Stephen. God, just bless him. Give him everything he needs, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that workshop. If you'd like to discover more content like this, check out the VU Friends and Family Network, created to equip you with free resources and real relationships. And hey, don't miss out on an opportunity to be in the room next year for VUCon 2024, a gathering of global leaders designed to strengthen your faith and connect you to community.